Three decades after the release of what many consider to be the original summer blockbuster, stories of the hardships experienced during the filming of Jaws are the stuff of Hollywood legend. It filled me up with stories that I could dine out on for 35 years. If I wanted to, I could just hold back any but the stories from Jaws. Through accounts like Carl Gottlieb's The Jaws Log and numerous television documentaries, Multitudes of movie buffs are familiar with those famous tales of the shark not working. We're all groping in the dark for a way to tell the story because the shark wasn't working. It kept breaking down. It is as if God created the devil and gave him Jaws. <laughs> Jaws, one of Hollywood's little movies that couldn't emerged as a record-shattering box office juggernaut, then an Oscar contender, and today stands as a critically acclaimed, enduring classic that after all this time shows no sign of losing its bite. What we are dealing with here is a perfect engine, uh, an eating machine. Michael, did you hear your father out of the water now? If you open the beaches on the 4th of July, it's like ringing the dinner bell. This shark, swallow you whole. My heart was beating so fast. I didn't know, as an adult, I could get that scared anymore. One thing, it's a real thing, not a monster from outer space. Sharks are real. The film sparked a pop cultural obsession with sharks and heightened public awareness of real life shark attacks. And though numerous copycat pictures have come and gone, Jaws still remains that singular cinematic experience that keeps bathers close to the shore. The movie itself is what first put the terror into me. Every time you felt a bit of seaweed brush your, uh, your foot, you would have been uh, thinking about it. But I still get a little nervous in, in water, being like, um, is there a shark in here? <laughs> Not only did it impact the way movies are made and marketed, but it maintains a legacy kept alive by legions of fans, artists, and even successful filmmakers who cite this picture as a defining life experience, helping to make them who they are today. Anyone who's around my age who's in this movie business always kind of cites Jaws as like the first movie that made them want to get into movies. It's therefore no wonder that after 30 years, the shark is indeed still working. I was writing Jaws, I knew that it could not be a success. It couldn't be a success as a novel because first of all, it's a first novel and nobody reads first novels. It was a first novel about a fish, so give me a break, who cares? I knew they couldn't make a movie about it because the technology was nowhere near good enough to, to make a great white shark and I knew you couldn't catch and train one. So I had no sense that this was going to be a success beyond just being published. Until the movie had been open for a while and the paperback was selling millions of copies. And even then, who would have guessed that down the road it would have had any currency? I, I wouldn't have. Making Jaws, still looking back 30 years ago, was the toughest filmmaking production experience I've ever encountered. Nothing's ever come close to the production 
difficulties of shooting an actual special effects movie, not a digital effects movie, that was many, many years later, but a mechanical effects movie, not in a tank somewhere in Malta or some safe tank somewhere in Florida, but in the actual Atlantic Ocean. We must have been complete idiots to have even expected to have an easy ride in the middle of the ocean making a movie. The ingathering of all the uh, mystical tribes and shamans and crazy experts that floated in under the banner of Universal to make this movie uh, had overlooked in that it was the first film ever really shot on the ocean. They hadn't really known that. The approach that Spielberg had then, remember that he, he was fresh then, he was new and young, and he insisted that this movie be shot on the ocean. And that alone uh, was an innovation because Universal at the time would normally have gone to a back lake and shot on the lot, and he wouldn't let them. We all gained a tremendous respect for the sea, for nature, for currents and tides, for waves for rain and sun and overexposure to both. We started shooting on the 1st of May, and we were supposed to shoot until June 28th. If you're really quiet, you could hear someone laughing. The movie went on for, what, a total of seven months, something like that, almost a year. If you figure when the first crew got there and the first special effects people, and then the actors came, and then, you know, it just went on and on and on and on and we thought we were gonna be there for the rest of our lives. It's not the time it takes to take the take that takes the time. It's the time it takes between the takes that takes the time that takes the take. The sea conditions have been so impossible that uh, it's really hurt our schedule and uh, you know, put a general, general somber note behind the scenes uh, uh, on the production because we've been here 105 shooting days uh, and we were only scheduled for something like 65 or 70. And they started the shoot without a cast, without a script, and without a shark. And that was, you know, after May 1st. And we're going. And we're shooting. What are we shooting? I don't know. What are we doing? No, because he'll be, he'll be so energetic. He'll be screaming and yelling. It's a great way. It's a great way. I knew it all along. And there's only... It's hard to imagine a world where Steven Spielberg isn't a household name. But in 1974, it was viewed by some as a roll of the dice to put the weight of such a mammoth project on the shoulders of a 27-year-old relative newcomer, a director who had only just completed work on his first theatrical release, The Sugarland Express. I remember a reporter one time asking me, Mr. Zanuck, are you trying to enhance this young director's career? And I said, no, just the opposite. I'm trying to enhance my career. Probably nobody else in the world knew at that time, better than I, who was every day on the Sugarland Express, how good this guy was and how he could tell a story. Steven Spielberg storyboarded the actual scenes and then shot them. And the studio production department wanted to know every storyboard there was. They didn't know every storyboard there was. We had a bunch of them that we never told them about that we'd sneak and shoot. It was a guerrilla movie. I like to think of it as a big independent movie masquerading as a big studio movie. It was the film's title monster, a 12-ton hydraulic shark that would become affectionately known as Bruce, that plagued Spielberg and the Jaws production team with their most daunting set of complications. Once the idea was set that we were going to build it, then we had to determine the size. And I was working off of a scale model of my research of a shark that was about 12 and a half feet. And so I just doubled it because I felt that uh, as the sharks got bigger, they got girthier and they weren't so attractive. So I figured a 25 foot shark would be the proper size. Don Chandler was a studio sculptor. He started on the outside, a big clay model. We were going to make a mold. And so we were making a skeleton out of chromoly tubing, both things at once, and hoping that they would fit together perfectly, which they did. 
My part that they gave me mostly was the cosmetics of the thing and the skin and the looks of it and all that. And when a, something would mechanical would break in the shark and the shark's head would turn clear over, of course it would rip. And then it, you know they bring it back to me and say fix it. Then we'd have to patch the whole shark. Veteran effects supervisor Bob Matty, who had created the famous squid from Disney's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, was mastermind of the shark's mechanical workings. <laughs> Bob Matty, my mentor, is the greatest guy in the world. He loved, I mean, he loved what he did. I just fell in right behind Bob. He was like my hero. There was never, ever a down day. I mean, he was pretty much tireless, and he always looked at the upside. It was a good thing, too, as Matty and his team promptly discovered that Jaws would produce technical challenges unlike any movie previously attempted by Hollywood. The condition of the shark was the ultimate story. The shark didn't work, what do you do? When your lead actor, which is this 12-ton marvel, is recalcitrant. Well, like any recalcitrant actor, you shoot around him or her. Not that a recalcitrant shark was always to blame for setbacks during the shoot. For a Hollywood film crew with little or no maritime experience, finding their sea legs didn't always come easily. It didn't take long for one thing to become perfectly clear. Making Jaws, whether by land or sea or foam, would be no day at the beach. We were starting to shoot all of the land scenes and running out of them very quickly. And uh, Carl got leave, and Roy, David and Dick, the producers, Stephen, myself, and uh, Verna Fields and her son would meet every day at Stephen's bungalow and try to make sense of the next day's work or the days after. With no shark to shoot and an ever-inflating budget, they made the very most of these meetings. The logistical setbacks allowed Spielberg and his actors to become a little repertory company, free to invent and improvise. The thing I remember most is Stephen, obviously, allowing the actors to ad-lib, because a lot of this was ad-lib. They want to get drunk and fool around, they eat coffee, I mean, all these do dead doll's eyes. That was, that's my favorite. I think that's one of the things that was so extraordinary. The scene with the little boy at the table, after Brody's had a particularly hard day, we were in between shots, and I was at the, you know, I was like this at the table, and then that little kid was like this. We started with our hands underneath our chin. Then he'd do this, and I'd do that. Then I went, and he went. Then he made a, a monster face, and I kind of went like that. And I went out to the kitchen in the house. I said to Stephen, come, come here, watch this. And I went through all the motions, and the little guy went copied right after me. He said, OK, and he brought the camera in, and, and we did that scene. With the summer season fully upon them, frustration began to mount amidst the already exhausted crew as discouraging reports of the film's malfunctioning antagonist continued to spread across the island. It was, if not the first movie with the radio mics, it was the first one that I was aware of that had all these radio mics all over the island. So every day, you could hear this. <laughs> The shark is not working, repeat. The shark is not working, repeat. The shark is not working. And that was the constant refrain, because every time they tried to test the shark, it would come up like, or uh, its eye would fall out. Uh, I have a saying in films that uh, film companies import their problems. They don't find them where they go. And uh, in our case, uh, we imported our problem, and that was the shark. And we didn't have enough testing time. And on Bob Maddie's behalf, if we had given him the 15 weeks that it took to work the bugs out of the shark, it would have worked on cue. We were pioneers, and that's the best word I can think of, because nobody had ever taken on the Atlantic Ocean in small boats. No one had ever worked with a mechanical shark of the, of the sophistication of ours. You know, we struggled like mad, but the end justified the means. 
Then one day you heard this. The shark is working. Repeat. The shark is working. Repeat. The shark. What you see in the finished picture is practically every frame of usable footage of the shark. And down. Rip it off. One more time. Shark comes up, bites at the mast, snaps two or three times, shaking the head, but always working his way into the mast. Okay, start it. Okay, Roy, action. Bring it in, bring it in. In the last shot, before we all went back to Long Beach for another month of shooting uh, in California, was going to be the shot of the shark blowing up. We were rigging the shark to blow up and blow scrib and all kinds of stuff up into the air, and they were loading it. And finally, the sun went down, and I'm shooting high speed. And I said, Stephen, they're not ready, and I can't shoot high speed. Stephen said, you shoot it in the morning. Stephen went to the airport, got on the airplane. He was already packed and left the island. He was ready to go. I said, goodbye, I'm going back to LA. And I got into a motorboat and sped back to the mainland. Stephen and I were on a flight back to LA, and I said, so who's, uh, who, 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 how was the last shot? You know, they blow up the... He said, um, uh, they're doing it right now. I said, they're doing it right now, why aren't you there? He goes, <laughs> and I said, Stephen? He said something like, well, he, he got word. He knew that they were going to throw him in. So he decided to just skip out and not do the last shot. Not do the last blowing up shot. Yeah, not do that one. Which became, by the way, a tradition of Stevens. He never would do the last shot of his movies because he thought the crew was always going to do something. And he probably was right. Had I been on his crew, I would have. Um, but it's become a tradition that Steven never shoots his last shot. One day, I'm going to use this information. With the production of the film completed, and Benchley's book already a raging success, the makers of Jaws braced themselves, hoping the fruit of their labor would live up to the reputation of the novel that inspired it. Little did they realize that their fish story was about to change the face of Hollywood. I couldn't really see beyond all of the screw-ups that were apparent to me and were more apparent than anything else. And so in my ignorance, which is pure ignorance, I was saying, oh, this is going to be a disaster. And then we made this movie that crashed into people like a speeding truck. The book had become a bestseller while we were shooting the picture, but still no one had any thought or even dared to think that it would become what it became. Part of it is that it was overambitious for the budget, that the technology was not there, that they had to, you know, use parts of their brain that, you know, that they you don't normally have to unless you're in desperate mode. And when an artist is pushed like that, um, amazing one-of-a-kind things happen. That's what, that's what happened in Jaws. It was just an extraordinary, a perfect creative storm. Who knew? Who knew? But you know, it's like all of these phenomenons, they just happen. If you planned it, it would never be a phenomenon. Roy Scheider. Robert the Shaw. film's groundbreaking ad campaign was highly instrumental in its initial box office success. I think Jaws affected filmmaking in a lot of ways. I think that's when they first started using television to really advertise movies, so it made this huge opening and everybody went out to see it. And the anticipation was unbelievable. Unbelievable. It, I, no, no one had ever anticipated a movie much like that that I remember. I mean, it really did create this sensation around the planet of, all right, here it comes. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution. Underscoring the TV spots and theatrical trailers for Jaws was the familiar but ominous voice talent of character actor and voice artist Percy Rodriguez. 
they had an idea of doing a very high, horrifying delivery, which I disagreed with. And uh, we discussed it. And finally, around they came around to the idea that I had in mind that we would do it at a more level, devastating presentation, rather than trying to ride over this terrifying visual that they had. I felt that I should go underneath it and let the visual sell. It is as if God created the devil and gave him jaws. The level of advertising was very high pitched. And afterward, they had people afraid to go in the water for years, you know? And uh, I like to think that uh, I contributed to that fear. <laughs> See it before you go swimming. Everyone who grew up around that period knows the voice. He was the gateway for a lot of people, you know, into, into the Jaws universe. He was like the weed to, to what would become the crack of Jaws, you know? It's just like you had to get through Percy and Percy's dulcet tones that drew you into that movie and then got you hooked in a big, bad way. Once Jaws premiered, it demonstrated just how hooked moviegoers were and marked a decisive turning point at the box office. The buzz generated by advanced screenings demanded that it become the first movie ever to be released in over 400 theaters. And it could have been even more. When the screening in Long Beach, California took place, Lou Wasserman, the chairman of the board of Universo, asked Hi Martin, who was the head of distribution, to cut back on the number of theaters. Hi said, we've set a record. We've got 600 theaters. Ever since the Dallas preview, I cannot stop the phone from ringing. And Lou said, cut it in half. And everybody was kind of stunned. Cut it in half. Why? He said, I want people in Palm Springs, California, to have to come to Los Angeles to see the movie. I don't think we thought that we were releasing a, quote, event movie. We thought we had a very successful movie. We thought they should be waiting to see it. My colleague Lou Wasserman always thought that the best advertising was people standing in line. Lou said, I wanted this to be something that you couldn't get into. He wasn't interested in just taking the weekend. He wanted to take the summer, and we took the summer. When you opened in 400 theaters, it was different. You could play all summer, and if you looked at the grosses, the grosses were constant. Smoking lodge is sold out, seats downstairs in the first seven rows only. When the movie was out for like weeks and months, I would still be going to the movies, not to see a new movie, but to see Jaws again. And, uh, you know, one for Jaws, and they'd look at you like, again? You know, it's like, dude, just give me the ticket, you know? They began to see that the film could become an event and a marketing phenomenon. Of course, nowadays, it's the marketing of a film is more important than the film itself. And uh, I think we can attribute a lot, a lot of that to the success of Jaws. It happened to work on a, on a very mainstream level, on a mass audience level, but the movie itself was so incredibly solid and, and beyond solid, just exceptional from end to end that when, when people throw together their summer movies and the eye candy stuff, they just tend to forget that that movie was a lot more than just eye candy. Although it is credited with having started the syndrome of summer blockbusters and mindless movies and all that stuff, the fact is that Jaws, and I think many critics will agree, was a fine movie of that genre, which was very rare. Jaws, only the exorcist, could be compared with Jaws, a stunningly effective thriller sending shivers of terror down the spine, the most perfectly constructed horror story of our times, as terrifying an adventure as has ever been put on the screen. Wonderful movie making from start to finish, destined to become a classic. Given its monstrous success and critical acclaim, Jaws was roundly expected to receive the lion's share of Oscar nominations for that year, including Best Director for Steven Spielberg. But unfortunately, those high expectations came up short. And oh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I wasn't nominated. I got beaten up by Fellini. Jaws did get the nomination for Best Picture. Jaws. Yay! Well, it's about time. But it was in light of this 
that some in the industry thought it scandalous that Stephen would be overlooked for best director. Who made the picture? Somebody's mother? The director. This man made yours. Are you kidding? Who's kidding who around here? It's the biggest disappointment for me of the whole Oscars. I, uh, I thought Stephen did a brilliant job directing Jaws, and I have no idea what happened. I, I, it's the one thing that I cannot comprehend yet in my head, how a best picture can be nominated, and yet the director, who is basically responsible for it, does not get the nomination. But for the 27-year-old Wunderkind director, there was no choice but to take his lumps. I'm suffering enough. All right, we're suffering no more, with I'm you. suffering. We're suffering Cancel my day. Right, we're getting Although Jaws did not receive the Oscar for Best Picture, it did bring home awards for its remaining three nominations, Best Sound, Best Editing, and Best Musical Score. Throughout the rest of the year, Jaws continued to reel in numerous other industry awards, even as the record books were being rewritten. In hindsight, one wonders if the Academy would rethink overlooking Spielberg's masterful work on Jaws, if they knew then what they certainly know now. Of course, a much decorated career still lay ahead for Steven a now legendary career that encompasses perhaps the most popular and diverse body of work ever created by an individual director, making Steven Spielberg one of the most influential figures in the entire film industry. And it was all jump-started by Jaws. Audience fascination with Jaws was by no means limited to the US. Shortly after its domestic release, Jaws swam its way into theaters across the globe, and moviegoers couldn't get enough. The biggest thing I remember about Jaws is traveling around the world, promoting it, and whether it was in South Africa or Australia or Latin America, every culture in the world embraced Jaws. Peter Benchley's book, which was with the start of it all, was a sensation. Somehow the idea of this creature attacking mankind caught on everywhere. I've been to many places in the world and Jaws has reached almost every place I've ever been. At first I thought maybe we'll do okay in cities near great bodies of water. But it turned out that some of our best business were in tremendous desert countries. I think the reason it went around the world so quickly was that you don't even need dialogue. I mean, you just see the situation there. And your own primal fear about something you can't see into is enough to hold your interest in that movie. It's a universal movie, and uh, not just Universal Studios, but it really has a global impact. I really think it works like a silent movie. You're responding to the, the visuals instinctively in a visceral way. The, the coincidence of that, plus Stephen's innate talent as a filmmaker, made a film that will, will live. It has to live. It's not, uh, it's not going away anywhere. There's no culture on Earth that does not have that film and show it. It was shown in 40 countries, in 17 different languages. Go, 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 go. If you forgot what terror is like, the original Jaws is back. And then there was the merchandising blitz. Almost overnight, Jaws became a cottage industry, and suddenly sharks meant big business. When we realized what we had, merchandising was licking their lips and it just was such an easy one to merchandise. It started obviously with what everybody does with the t-shirts, but it went from there. Everything kind of mushroomed with the release of the picture. I even had a, a toilet seat that when you open it up, it was a big shark facing you. So, I mean, everything, lunch pails to barbecue sets, it was uh, incredible. And one of the first big merchandising events to take place in connection with the movie. Though three decades have come and gone since the Jaws merchandising frenzy, for some voracious collectors, the summer of the shark never ends.
In recent years, the picture's enduring popularity has seen a resurgence of Jaws-related paraphernalia, from children's toys to high-end collectibles to video games. Another milestone in the evolution of entertainment was the commercialization of the making of Jaws. Though commonplace today, capitalizing on a picture's behind-the-scenes accounts was rarely, if ever, seen in the mid-70s. I'd always been interested in movies as something more than just sitting there and passively observing them. The Jaws log by Cole Gottlieb and Edith Blake's book, of The Making of the Movie Jaws, both of those were inspiration for making me interested in films. Well, Jaws as a film, to me, is, first of all, my favorite film. I watch it once a year. And when you examine the film in its finished state and you look at the process in making the film, or you read the Carl Gottlieb's Jaws log, or you just read the other histories, or as I remember reading about it even as a kid, it's almost like film school in a movie. I remember in film school reading an interview with Steven Soderbergh who said that he was Jaws obsessed and that his favorite book was the Jaws log and that he carried it with him everywhere. And I thought, okay, I'm on the right track. That book became my Bible. And I read that book over and over and over. Well, in the beginning, when the book was first conceived, it was kind of a hasty afterthought to the marketing plan. The original intent was for there to be a three-parter. The book would be written from Steven Spielberg's point of view, he would contribute a third. From Peter Benchley's view, he would contribute a third. And Zanuck and Brown would contribute a third as producers. And as we got closer and closer to the release date, it became evident that nobody was going to be able to write their third. I had already agreed with Stephen to kind of ghostwrite or author his, his third of it from what I knew, because we had shared a house and I knew what Stephen's perspective on the movie was. So then nobody was available. Stephen was immersed in post-production. Uh, Zanuck and Brown were on to something else. So they said to me, kind of at the end of March, can you do a book by, you know, the end of May? And with the, you know, the folly of youth, I said, yeah, I can write a book that quickly. Uh, so I wrote the book in a very short time, probably less than a month. And the original paperback got favorable reviews, and the word of mouth was terrific, and the book went through 17 printings and sold a couple of million copies. And then, of course, many years later, Laurent Bouzereau did his behind-the-scenes documentary on the same subject matter. You know, Universal came out with what they called the Signature Series back in the Laserdisc days. And the Jaws box set that included the Laurent Bouzereau documentary was something that every Jaws fan just had to have. They went out and bought Laserdisc players just so they could have that documentary. When I got to the Jaws documentary for the Laserdisc, I felt that I'm going to try to do a Bible or some kind of a reference to that particular movie. Because how many times do we get to sit across Steven Spielberg or Peter Benchley and the cast members? But you want to get all of their different perspectives. And I think for the true fans, you're just looking at those people as if they were talking to you. You know, I had seen all those pictures of Brody's son in the arms of the stuntman. And I always wondered, like, that's not in the movie. And yet that picture was used to promote the picture, you know. And I was always, like, wondering, what is that sequence? What is that scene, you know? And finding the footage of that was amazing, you know. Seeing that when the shark comes into the estuary, you know, it's just a fin, you know, I, I thought that's pretty amazing. Finding that footage of the building of the shark, doing all the tests dry, <laughs> you know, and then getting the big surprise that it doesn't work in water. I mean, it was just amazing. You know, I felt like I was doing what I had been sent on Earth to do, you know, to discover all that stuff, you know, and to make sure it was preserved. Because a lot of it, I think that if there had not been DVDs today, you know, I think a lot of that stuff would be totally lost today. Always an important step in advancing public awareness of a movie, both during and after its theatrical run, is the film's poster design. And in the case of Jaws, few images have become more emblazoned on pop culture than this one. That image is iconic and was responsible for getting a lot of people into the theaters to see Jaws. You know, what kid wouldn't want to go see that movie? It's almost like a, a bullet before it hits somebody, and the fact that it leaves it all to your imagination is what, you know, the poster of Jaws did so well. It conveyed all the emotion that 
what is aroused by the fear. And it, you just got it. The minute you look at that image, you got it. Jaws' poster is the Bible of how to do it, you know? It, it's, that's all you need to know. You know, you don't need to know about the main characters and their arcs or anything like that. Big shark, pretty girl, bad situation. One of the things that happens when you do an iconic film is it becomes a touchstone for other artists and other comments. The Jaws artwork became an element of political cartoons, you know, for years. In fact, the shark and swimmer were used to represent virtually every issue in the political spectrum. And it wasn't just politics getting in on the action. Over the years, even up to this day, the Jaws motif has served as fodder for a variety of more offbeat applications. But what today has become a pop culture icon actually had very humble beginnings. The art of the swimmer, swimming above the the great white shark originated on the cover of the paperback edition of Peter Benchley's novel, Jaws, published by Bantam Books. And Oscar Distel was the chairman of the company and always regretted that he didn't put, he didn't sell it to us. He could have sold us the artwork, but he gave it to us as a publicity thing. So I get him about it to this day. One name that is not as well known in the annals of Jaws history is Roger Castell, the artist who created the legendary image. Castell was a seasoned paperback and magazine illustrator working in New York, whose skills were increasingly in demand at the time. And the assignment was simply one among many. Oscar Dissel said, have I got a great book for you. Uh, you'll love it. You can read it over the weekend. They felt the hardcover version wouldn't work on the paperback. I did a very rough sketch, and, and they said, that's great, just make the shark realistic and bigger. Make him very much bigger. I had gone to the Museum of Natural History, and I had my camera with me, and I said, do you have a shark exhibit in the building? And she said, yes, they do. But it was all down, and they were refurbishing. They were uh, cleaning them. All the sharks, we're laying on easels, uh, they're plaster, and uh, so I had my camera with me. Well, I knew what position I wanted the shark in, and this is the great white that they had laying on an easel, being, uh, I guess they were dusting it, and uh, that's what I worked from. The girl was uh, photographed in the studio in New York. She was a great model. I used her for a uh, good housekeeping painting and asked if she would stay another half hour and just swim for this paperback. Uh, you know, told her Jaws. I don't think anyone knew what Jaws was then. But uh, she was swimming on a stool. Last summer, I was painting in the studio, and my grandson Luke came in and he says, Grandpa, did you ever do a Mona Lisa? And he's uh, seven. Uh, that really threw me. And I thought, and I said, I don't think I, I've done the Mona Lisa, Luke. And he said, well, the shark will just have to be your Mona Lisa. Da -da. Da -da, da -da. The theme song, John, just the first expression that comes to my mind. It just sticks in there, you know what I mean? I think Jaws was the first film that I did that I, where I was really crazy about the film. I thought it was a marvelous film. 
So I remember the first day I played, Stephen said, what we do for the shark? And I just played an octave E on the piano and then E and then F and repeated them and accelerated them and so on. And he said something like, you think that'll work? You gotta be kidding, it's so simple. All he did was bum, 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 bum. And Stephen said, that's all? And John said, yeah, that's it. Well, I think John, who's prescient about all the movies he scores, he sees deeper than we do about our own work. And I think he saw something deeply primal about Jaws, and he decided that it needed a primal response. It needed a primal sound, something that was, that was atavistic, something that was extremely basic, and something that was unforgettable and would be almost a, a, a kind of a siren to warn you that something was coming to get you. When you associate the image of that shark coming in for the kill, and you hear that John Williams score, bum, 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 bum. you just, it is, it's that perfect storm again. It's the right image for the right music. It doesn't happen all the time. But boy, when it does, you never forget it for generations, obviously. The George theme was so provocative and symbolic of the shark that he saved us, really, because the many times that we didn't have the shark, all we had to do was point the camera out to sea and play his score, and everybody screamed. And half the film, you don't see the shark. You don't have to. You hear that theme, and it puts it, oh my god, he's out there somewhere, and he's going to get somebody. I just think it was the most brilliant couple of notes that he's ever written because it, it's lived beyond the movie. And it's become the thing that kids do with each other when they're playing in the pool. You can always creep up on somebody and go da 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 da. And in the post Jaws world, it means something. In Australia, they use the shark uh, theme as a, as a warning sound on the beaches. <laughs> I love that in the loudspeakers. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 I'm out of here. No one would stay in the water listening to that music. Every movie after that, whenever you saw any kind of a monster beast, especially sea stuff like a shark, octopus, whatever, it was like the, the pounding. Boom, boom, boom. Da -da. Da -da. Don't. Da -da, da -da, da -da, Don't. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. Ugh, that song gives me the creeps. What do you mean? It's our theme song. It's very flattering. You know, I think you think, oh, great, that's, you know, it, it's whatever I've written has made it to that level. That's one reaction that I, that I think is natural, and I'm always pleased about it. The fact that it gets up off the paper, into the orchestra's hands, out through the microphone, and around the world, back into my own living room, which is my own studio where I've been working sometimes years later, is quite a miraculous, tr you know, electronic trip that composers in preceding centuries would never have had uh, the pleasure of experiencing. So we're lucky that film and recorded music and so on has the reach that it does. While the digital effects revolution, which took hold in the early 90s, promised to offer filmmakers tremendous creative freedom, the legacy of Jaws reminds us that being unable to show everything you want really can be a blessing in disguise. We complained about the shark not being able to perform because it couldn't, it was never ready. That was what saved us. That was the art artistry of the film. If Jaws never existed, except in the year 2005, I would have had the digital tools to have much more of the shark in the movie. Therefore, I would have ruined much more of the movie. Had we been able to computerize a shark, a lot of the wonderful elements of the picture, like the barrels, would never have been thought of. That was an idea that came during the production and out of frustration of not having the shark. We didn't have anything else to shoot. In the very first scene, with the girl being pulled back and forth, this shark was supposed to be there in the picture at that time. We only showed it later because we didn't have it earlier. They began Jaws in the opening scene by not seeing the shark, and I think it was more terrifying. Not seeing something, I really believe, is more terrifying, because visually, you're all right with it. But if your imagination runs wild, 
then it can be anything. I did that because the shark kept breaking down. And today, a digital shark would not break down. There'd be some nice interactive water explosions to marry the digital shark with the actual water. That's all it would be. There would not have been a full-size shark or probably even any segment of the shark in a 2005 Jaws today. And therefore, the film would have been only half as effective. So I was saved by the breakdown in technology 30 years ago. I think if I'm, if I'm correct about this, it was 55 minutes into the movie before you actually saw the shark. One of the things that makes the picture more believable is that you can't do many things with that shark. You know, you have one shark that goes right, one that goes left, and one that goes straight ahead. Almost made it more believable, because you couldn't do any fancy stuff with it. And I can't help but think that filmmakers today would want to do a lot more with that shark. In today's movies, everybody's trying to top, you know, themselves, and they're trying to top others, and they're just trying to do it bigger and better. And sometimes bigger isn't better, necessarily. Sometimes bigger is too much. It's hard to create something new that surprises people. This day and age, they've seen so much already. There's so many movies now. What was great about that, I think the expectations for what a movie could be weren't what they are today. So you have a great movie like that come out back then, and it just floored people. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me and said, because of Jaws, I will not go in the water to this day. It is staggering. Come on in the water! Take it easy, take it easy. I mean, Jaws essentially did for swimming what the movie Psycho did for showering in motel rooms. The shower scene in Psycho, where women especially weren't taking showers, I didn't go in the ocean after Jaws. I was at the beach one day, and a woman came over to me, and she, she had her little child in hand. He was about five years old, and he was crying. And, and she said, are you Steven Spielberg? And I said, yes, I am. And she, and she began screaming at me with a very thick New York accent, you tell him, you tell him it's safe to go out there. You tell him it's safe to go out there. Look at him, look what you've done to him. And this kid was crying his eyes out, you know? And I said, what happened? She said, my husband showed him Jaws and now look, he won't go into the water. You tell him it's okay, you tell him it's all make-believe. And she gave me such a piece of her mind. I sat the boy down, I looked him in the eye, and I couldn't lie to him, it is dangerous out there. I couldn't just say to him, yes, go, go out there, go out beyond the waves, you know? It's all psychological. You yell barracuda. Everybody says, huh, what? You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. You know, the structure of Jaws is just so perfect. It just breaks up into these beautiful acts, and it's like, you know, problem, you know, finding the answer, and then the third act of we're gonna go get this shark. It's such a beautiful mythological structure. Is this monster about things in them? I got no spit. As all great storytelling is, is, you know, that the characters learn something about themselves, you know, their phobias, the things that they're lacking. Um, why are they chasing this thing, you know, the white whale? It's Melville. It's Hemingway. It's the ancient prophet Jonah. These are the mythological parallels that bubble up from below the surface in Jaws that make it a timeless classic that make it last long, long after the technological aspects of the film are old hat. It's a very classic, you know, hero's journey kind of a story if you subscribe to the myth-making nature of screenwriting. It has all the ingredients that are not culturally specific to a generation's views. It's, it's not Depression America, it's not Vietnam America, it's a little timeless island with only the human values of you know, fear or jealousy or heroism or shark obsession. Part of what succeeds about Jaws is the simplicity of the way the story was told and the fact it's three men in a boat. 
when it, it come right down to it, you know, three survivors who, who all have problems with each other. You got city hands, Mr. Hooper. You've been counting money all your life. All right, all right. Hey, I don't need this. I don't need this working class hero crap. They have huge personal issues with each other, but those are all cast aside as they have to become partners in order to, to help each other live and, and get through the experience. And the shark becomes less important than those three characters. And I have to give Peter Benchley total credit for that. That was in the book. The characters in Jaws are composites, all of them are. I, in, in Jaws, am two people. I am Hooper from the environmental point of view. I am the guy who says he doesn't want to hurt you, he just wants to eat you. On the other hand, I'm also the character of Brody in that every book I've written has been an everyman kind of book of what if. What would happen if a normal Joe gets himself into a position that is way beyond his capacity to handle it. And here's Brody, who doesn't swim, who's never been in the ocean in his life, who's a retired New York City policeman, who's out in the boondocks, and suddenly he's cast into having to be a seaman? Uh, this is ridiculous. After watching a stumble bum like uh, Brody, you know, save his neck by just doing what almost anybody would do in a situation. You get a gun, you get out of the boat, you try to save yourself, you get up on the mast, you shoot the thing, you know, you do what you have to do. So much so that you feel like you have done it. Everybody sitting in the audience did it because I certainly did not show any courageous aspect of myself up to that point. And the characters drive you so forward that by the time the shark is, you know, flapping its mouth, jumping onto the boat, all you can think of is, Quint, get your feet away from its mouth. Just kick it, get it away. Stab it, get it away. Oh, no, 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 no. Ah, shit. Ah. You've got the family unit in the first half of the film, the Brody's very, very personable family that you just, right away you love them when they wake up in the morning and you're there with them. They're in the yard, not too far from the car. How's that? Like you're from New York. I always said that the characters in the movie were just reminding me of like, you know, relatives. That's how I, I, I felt I knew them. You had such a great handle on depicting suburban, middle class, everyday American life. And what he put up there was almost documentary like. I mean, it, it was just so real. One of the things that Jaws did that I wish movies still did more of is invade a community and use actual locals in the movie. It, it brings the movie to life in such a real way. Islander Lee Fierro, who portrayed the grieving mother of doomed Alex Kittner, still lives on the vineyard today. Her now infamous confrontation scene with Chief Martin Brody has become a favorite sequence among Jaws fans. Chief Brody? <laughs> yes? It's been accurately recorded that she had to slap the chief many, many times in order to get just the right take. Little did she know then that her slapping days had just begun. How many times have I been asked to slap somebody? I've never counted them, and so I can't tell you, but it happens a lot, and it, it, it is mostly young men. I do it to please the fans. But last year, I decided that is it. I've, I've slapped my last slap. Meeting Steve Spielberg was a wonderful memory. He asked me if I could improvise, and I said, yes, I can. And so we did, Shari Rhodes, the uh, casting director, and I improvised the beach scene. But I had simply been told, keep my son out of the water, so that's what I was doing. And Steve stopped me and said, Lee, you gotta let him go in the water or we don't have a movie. They had a raft that was cut in half, and they take my raft away, and they put this half a raft over this. It was like that round that they filled up with blood and all this stuff. He goes, now, lie on the half a raft on top of this, and it's going to blow up. When it blows up, go underwater and stay under there as long as you can. So they, you're 12 years old, lying on this, and it's saying it's full of blood. They're saying it's going to blow up. And it's like, I'm lying there, and all of a sudden, this thing blows up and there's blood's going up all over the place in your face. And I just went underwater, 
Look here, cut. Okay, your leg was out of the water, and they had a reef. It took like over an hour for all the blood to clear out of the water before they could do it again. I get to go inside one of these warm little dressing rooms. My friends were all freezing cold outside, but I screwed up, so I get to go stay warm. And after about four times of doing this, they finally said, no, we're going to try this a different way. And if you notice in the movie, I go up and down. It's like, because these guys in the wetsuit started, they grabbed me and they were pulling me under, lifting me up, pull it, and then they pulled me under and gave me their air. And that's how they finally did it. They gave up on, you know, a 12 year old kid trying to do it on his own. For the insert shot needed of Bruce biting down on little Alex, the dangers of interacting with a multi ton mechanical shark required that Jeffrey be replaced with a stunt double. In this case, a common store mannequin, and a female one at that. It was to be one of the very last shots done on the vineyard. Steven Spielberg had already departed the island, and filming was left in the capable hands of Joe Alves and the second unit. In true Jaws fashion, the scene proved extremely difficult to coordinate. But in the end, the shot would provide audiences with the now famous frightening first glimpse of Bruce. The folks were born here, right? Yeah, I'm an islander. Vineyard native Jonathan Philly, who played Tom Cassidy in the film, parlayed his one and only acting job into a solid career in the motion picture industry. I had done a lot of acting in high school and really thought that I wanted to pursue an acting career. And there I was on the vineyard and saw an ad in the paper for that they wanted extras for Jaws. So I sent in a snapshot of me at the beach the summer before with some friends and so, you know, circled that, that's me. And they cast me. There was so much stuff that they didn't need that was shot. You know, I was in and out of the production and around it quite a bit. There's a, a piece in the picture where this guy is complaining about to the chief that, you know, chief, the kids are karate chopping my fences. But, you know, of course, they didn't need the actual coverage of the kids karate chopping fences. What I really cherish about this movie is having grown up on Chappaquiddick, there's that wonderful scene of, you know, when they come over on the Chappaquiddick ferry, and the guy running the ferry is this old fella, Dick Hewitt, who passed away 15 years, 20 years ago. And Dick was, you know, an integral part of my childhood. And, and just seeing Dick, it, it brings back so many memories. For some fans, no pilgrimage to Amity is complete without looking up some of the many uncredited vineyard residents who make appearances in the film regardless of how minuscule their parts. Richard Dreyfus yells at me, ahoy, sloop, do you got a paddle? And I say, yeah, I got a paddle. You got a paddle on the boat? No, I got a paddle. And that was my one big line. I quit, Mr. Quint, I quit. My part was Quint's mate. There was a boat named the Scup Bucket. I had all the camera crew who were coming home. Steelberg says, will you do me a favor? And I says, I'll try to. He says, so will you take a speaking part with the dog? And I said, yes. So I went to clean up a little bit, and they, they told me I had to get dirty again. So I had to, I, they had to, I, I had to didn't have to shave, I couldn't shave anymore. I'm Henry Carrero, and uh, I was uh, one of the uh, two guys that claimed we caught this tiger shark that you see was right on this spot. And of course, it turned out to be the wrong shark. Right in this area, we had the shark here hanging by the tail, which is a real one that we were told cost, I don't know, maybe $10,000 to have it caught off Florida and flown up here special in a box. And they called him Oscar. So we got a lot of use out of that thing. But smell, oh, oh. oh that tiger shark really got right. I, don't, I didn't know who Dick, my partner, was until I met him that morning. And we hit it off very well. Funny, you know, he's a, char he's a character in his own right. I immediately just clicked with this guy, and and we started, you know, cracking each other up and making jokes. Henry's a very, very quick fella, but he can ad libs very well, and we played played very well off of one another. Gentlemen, the officer uh, asked me to tell you that you're overloading that boat. Uh, 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 Cross Dreyfus, he says, well, where's a good restaurant around here, whatever his line was, and, and I turn around and say, well, come straight ahead. Oh, oh, oh big lap, right? Yeah, yeah. And he left it in. Well, then can you tell me if there's a good restaurant or hotel on the island? Yeah, uh, you walk straight ahead. <laughs> <laughs> They're all going to die. Come on, 
Spielberg said, just say what comes into your head. All I'm, you know, I'm going to stuff your you. freaking head in there, man, and find out if it's a man. You know, all right? Yeah, stuff, man. Come on. So we had this guy who did an article in the local paper on Cape Cod, and he talked to Sherry Rhodes, and he says, boy, you must have an, you have a, an Abbott and Costello going here. She says, no, I just have two Costellos. Got a deep throat, Pratt. Yeah, well, but what kind? What kind of shark? It's a tiger shark. A what? There's one guy that pesters the hell out of me every time he sees me. He walks up behind me and says, Oh, what? That's probably going to be my famous, most famous thing I've ever said in my life. A what? Mom, I got cut. I got hit by a vampire. Then 12-year-old Chris Rebello, who played Chief Brody's elder son, Michael, remained on the vineyard until his untimely passing from a heart attack in the year 2000. Chris was a friend. Uh, we grew up together on the island. Working with Chris in the movie, he was, he was, he was a brother, another brother to my family. On set, we used to fool around and play, and you know, sometimes Stephen would say, okay, that's enough. It's time to get back to work. Let's do our thing. After the movie was done, he didn't do any more acting. He went on to work for the Steamship Authority with my brother, Tommy, and that's where he worked until, until his passing. Yeah, we really miss him. Really miss him. Perhaps no Islander gained more notoriety for his involvement in Jaws than the late Craig Kingsbury. Craig's gruff and blustery demeanor had made him a local legend in his own right, and his portrayal of fisherman Ben Gardner a favorite among Jaws fans. Marcus. They advertised for some person who was a fisherman, a local, who could help Robert Shaw with his accent. Robert was a refined British actor uh, until he met my father. And then my father told him stories about this island and the people who live here. And unfortunately, I think Robert Shaw believed them. He fell hook, line, and sinker. And so he began to repeat them. And he was interviewed on the air telling these totally outrageous stories about the local community. You've got rich people here. There's a lot of the skeletons in the cupboard here, you know. There's more incest going on in Martha's Vineyard than probably any state of the, in the United States. Oh, yeah. And they were mostly lies, which is what my father was best at. They will wish their fathers had never met their mothers when they start taking their bottoms off. My mother, when I took her to see the movie in Boston, we came out of the theater and she said, that Spielberg, he is a genius. Finally, somebody has found a use for your father's empty head. Of course, Craig's most memorable scene did involve his head, but not the rest of him. In fact, it didn't even take place at the vineyard. 3,000 miles away in Van Nuys, California, Spielberg resourcefully created that most shocking moment as an insert shot. And he used little more than a foam life cast of Kingsbury and a swimming pool. Stephen had just come from the answer print with Verna at Universal and had signed off on it. And here we were on that very eve doing an extra shot that we were going to try to get in uh, the next day. That scene had already been shot, but it wasn't done to shock the audience. And so I went to Verna Field, my film editor's swimming pool, borrowed a pool, because I didn't have one. I didn't have enough money to have a swimming pool in those days because Jaws hadn't come out yet and I was a poor director then. We had a small replica of a hull that I'd put together in Joe Alves' driveway and I basically held my breath underwater and put the head of Ben Gardner through that hole when Frankie Sparks came up with the flashlight. But I remember I timed it to get it for maximum shock effect. This is the pool where Steven Spielberg filmed the Ben Garner sequence. Very and that famous. was done right here. Scary, scary moment. <laughs> what was the most satisfying edit you did in Jaws? The most satisfying edit, I have to say, was the, the face coming out of the boat. Because when I went to that preview and that audience just went six feet off their seats and let out this incredible scream, uh, that was really satisfying. <laughs> When we found this place, it was still full of her reels just sitting there, but it was amazing treasure to find. These are some footlockers that we found at the house. These came back from uh, Martha's Vineyard from the shoot there, and uh, you can see Verna Field's editorial jaws on the uh, cover of this one. And inside, there's several film reels of Verna's work still kept in these boxes here. This is full of different, different films that she made. 
Yeah, she had set up her editing facility here and, and edited all of her films in this building right here. It's kind of cool that this humble, simple room is where one of the greatest movies ever was put together. What, what, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a nice place to show that, he, that Quint refuses to slow down the boat. And here we have uh, the movieola that Verna Fields used to edit Jaws. Every second of the Jaws film passed through this machine by the hands of Verna Fields. That's special. Doesn't look very pretty now, but uh, maybe someday it will again. Verna and I worked in her pool house, you know, shoulder to shoulder for a long time on that movieola. And Verna did a great job with her biorhythms, creating a biorhythm for Jaws that was, that was, that was just the right kind of tautness, like a violin string, play a very, very high note. That's the spot, Steve. My husband tells me you're in sharks. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, yes, I, I've never heard it quite put that way, but uh, yes, I am. I love sharks. Yeah, I love them. I love them. I think the fascination with sharks comes from many things. One, they are the last surviving predator that poses a genuine threat to man in an environment in which he chooses to go. E.O. Wilson said, we don't just fear our predators, we are transfixed by them, prone to weave stories and fables because fascination breeds preparedness and preparedness survival. In a deeply tribal sense, he said, we love our monsters. I believe that worldwide, young children, all male children at least, have a fascination with either sharks or dinosaurs. And in my case, I was able to grow up around here in, in, in Tucket, where sharks were in proliferation. So I was able to fix my fascination on sharks. One couple whose fixed fascination led to their preeminence in the field of great white shark research was husband and wife team Ron and Valerie Taylor of Australia. Their combined experience throughout the 60s and 70s documenting these elusive animals made them the perfect fit for the Jaws creative team. They were commissioned to shoot live shark footage for the picture's climactic cage sequence. The assignment would prove to be almost as harrowing as anything in the film itself. I told them that there's a problem because our sharks on average, you're only about 13 feet in length, and yet your mechanical shark is 26 feet in length. And they said, well, there's no problem. We'll send you a small man and small cages. We built a scaled down cage, and we tried a dummy, and that didn't work. So we found a small person that said that they could scuba dive. Carl wasn't an experienced diver, so we gave him an introduction to diving, just down on the waterfront and took him out to Dangerous Reef. And when he saw his first great white shark, he was terrified. But to give him his credit, Carl actually did get into the cage with these great big, uh, dangerous looking great white sharks swimming around. Dangerous looking because we had put a lot of bait in the water to attract them to our cages. Joe Alves came into my office one day with his hand behind his back. And he said, Bill, we've screwed up. And he held up the tanks that had been miniaturized. He said, the little guy only has eight minutes of air. What we were not thinking is that a small person still sucks up as much air as a large person, and the tanks were very small. So immediately, when he sort of panicked, he sucked up all the air out of the tank. Carl was very reluctant. He was afraid, very afraid. Uh, the production manager was calling out to him to get in the cage, and he was very slow about it. And just as he was about to climb in, a large shark tried to swim over it and got its head stuck in the bridle. And of course, it was trapped, and it went crazy. And the tail went into the back part of the little boat and tore out all the hydraulic cables that took fuel and fluid to the motors. And it started to run across the deck. And as it did that, it, the tail flicked Carl's face. And Carl just stood there, and then he looked up and he said, is that my blood? And it was actually the, uh, 
the, the hydraulic fluid and uh, we never got him in the water again. If Carl had been in that cage, he would have lost his life. There wasn't much I could have done to uh, get over there. The shark was still tangled and thrashing around him, tangled in the cage on the bottom. Carl would have been in there and drowned. So his reluctance saved his life. men went into the water. The vessel went down in 12 minutes. Didn't see the first shark for about half an hour. Tiger. A, a very little credited writer who made the biggest breakthrough on Jaws, which was a writer named Howard Sackler, whose idea it was to give Quint the Indianapolis speech. Even though it was John Milius who wrote the speech. I mean, I mean, Howard Sackler wrote like two paragraphs this big. John Milius wrote a nine page monologue for um, Quint to say. And then when Robert Shaw, who himself was a writer of The Man in the Glass Booth, read Milius at 10 page, he says, I can't go on for 10, 15 minutes just talking. Let me have a crack at it. Shaw took the speech and, and, and himself edited it down to five pages. And that was the whole evolution of how that speech, speech was told. But it did come from the mind of Howard Sackler, who remembered the actual Indianapolis incident and suggested that Quint did that become a Rosetta Stone for Quint's entire character? Stephen thought, oh my God, that's the whole impetus, that's the whole spine of uh, Quint. He's not really just crazy, but he has a, he has a uh, case out for these sharks. You know, by the end of that first dawn, lost a hundred men. I don't know how many sharks, maybe a thousand. I don't know how many men, the average six an hour. The SS Indianapolis was top secret when Peter wrote the book. So it wasn't him. He would have used it, I think. And then before the making of the film, it had been uh, unclassified and Stephen used it. The world learned of the USS Indianapolis through Jaws, and it was a perfectly accurate depiction as far as I know. Peter's domestic housekeeper called him the day after the movie opened, and she said that she wasn't coming into work the next day. And when he said why, she said, my son was on the SS Indianapolis and I never knew how he'd died until now. Well, he'd been bitten in half below the waist. The US Naval cruiser, which delivered the atomic bomb used on Hiroshima, completed her mission, but was then sunk by a Japanese submarine. Out of her complement of 1,196 sailors and Marines, an estimated 300 died upon impact. And the rest spent five days in shark-infested waters before they were finally rescued. Only 317 survived. Anyway, we delivered the bomb. Robert was a pretty Promethean character, truly bigger than life. A man who intimidated me, who scared me, who exhilarated me, and I liked him and I hated him, and um, he had my number. You know, he could get me, and and he always did. He really thought Dreyfus needed a slapping down. A young punk with no stage experience. He he made me doubt that I could do things I knew I could do. Like he, one day he said. You couldn't, you, couldn't fall, um, you couldn't dive off the top of the Orca. You say, can. No, you couldn't. Can do. <laughs> and I couldn't. Sure, I would say, look at you, Dreyfus. You eat and you drink and you're fat and you're sloppy. Your age, it's criminal. Why, you couldn't even do 10 good push-ups. He'd say, I can do 20. And Shaw would say, you can do 20? Good push-ups. He said, okay, Roy, you're the referee. Tomorrow morning, we're gonna see if Dreyfus can do 20. As soon as Shaw left, I said, Dreyfus, you know how many people can do 20 good push-ups? You are not one of them. Couldn't do it. He psyched me. And because he psyched me, I was always like on guard. But I also really worshiped him as Robert Shaw. He was a grand artist as an actor. He was a wonderful writer. 
I think in those years I was very much appreciative of those things and uh, had had circumstances been different we might have worked together again farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies farewell and adieu you ladies of Spain on August 28 1978 at the age of 51 Robert Shaw died from a heart attack but his legacy lives on his now mythic portrayal of Quint continues to be remembered by celebrities. <laughs> well, let it do, my wee Spanish lady. And fans alike. <laughs> Bad fish. Well, I go down the pond and chasing bluegills and tommy cops. This shark can swallow you whole. <laughs> Mayor, chief, ladies and gentlemen, Commemorations of the film's central characters and scenes show up in the fine arts as well. Exquisite depictions from sculptors, painters, craftsmen, all fans from around the globe, reflect the creative excellence of the film itself. I have a tremendous appreciation for fans of Jaws that understand it even better than I do that have spent more time with it. Having you know, sites out there like JawsMovie.com, it confirms your identity to a generation that doesn't believe anything's real if it's not on the net. I love and appreciate the fact that the fans get it and get not, not only get it as a cultural phenomenon, but they get the ingredients and how the ingredients were mixed and how they were combined to fashion this entertainment. And I really love the fans for being so insightful. I'd like to present the key to the town of Amity to Mr. Peter Benchley. It was amazing to me to discover what Jaws Fest became. When I first heard about it, I thought it was going to be some rinky-dink uh, gimmick by the Chamber of Commerce of Martha's Vineyard, and they did it so well. It brought, what well, I guess, two, 3,000 people from all over the world. I was enormously impressed. This is the first time we've all been standing together, and that includes the making of the movie 30 years ago. There was no rap party. We never were all in the same place at the same time until now, so this is a more historic moment than you can imagine, and we thank you for it. So much interest in this movie. Movie. I had no idea that it had this national and international attention, and this is the Star Trek convention for people who love the movie Jaws. <laughs> it's that $3,000 bounty on the shark in cash or check. Now you yell shark, and we've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. Gee, Polly said he'd find you. There's a bunch of Boy Scouts on our April page on the last room for the merit badge. People have come from all over the world, well, from Dublin and Edinburgh and New Zealand and Australia, and it's just stunning. I think that to me really shows like the bones and the, the fan base of the movie. I think 30 years on is an achievement to have us all together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw that. I've got one in the Much larger version of it. Much larger version We're here to see the big shark, take some pictures. He can literally fit in there. He will literally swallow you whole. Do you know the Muffin Man? Well, say hello. I mean, being called the Muffin Man, I haven't been called that for years, <laughs> you know? Ladies and gentlemen, the cast of Jaws. This is the first time I saw Jaws on the widescreen in 26 years. The audience, of course, was so into it. I mean, what a great way to set up watching the film. You've got the ferry going by behind the screen. Salt air is filling your lungs. To see about 3,000 people sitting there watching the giant screen, it was the Jaws version of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Jaws is really unique in the way that it was filmed in, in this specific place. I mean, other movies are filmed on all kinds of obscure locations. Most people don't have a clue where they were filmed. Jaws was right here all over this island. 
and you can't really get, get away from it, even if you wanted to. Coming up on the left, you'll see the house that was used for the Brody residence in the film. It belonged to a if you wanted to go see a film location, things change and houses get painted, and most of the time, they're even on a soundstage. Well, with Jaws, you can take a ferry ride and you'll step off the ferry and you are in Amity. It has really not changed in 30 years. I do know that people come here on a regular basis. Jaws questions are probably some of the top questions we get in our visitor information centers. Um, they ask us quite often if they can still see some of the locations where scenes from the movie were filmed. The answer is yes. Uh, some of the scenes include South Beach, where the opening bonfire was done, uh, Amity Town Hall, which is actually Egertown Town Hall, right on Main Street in Egertown. Uh, also, the Chapquiddick Ferry um, is a very small ferry that takes you between Egertown and its island, which is Chappaquiddick. At the Grange Hall in West Tisbury, the Jaws Fest Behind the Screens exhibit is drawing hundreds of islanders and fans. Contributed by private collectors, these artifacts of Jaws have returned to the island for the first time in decades. Prop collecting has become really big business in recent years thanks to the internet. It's easy for people to find props from recent films all over the place. It's very difficult to find props from classic films, uh, especially a film like Jaws. I got into Jaws probably when I was about five years old. One of the first props I ever had was a harpoon gun. And if you're five years old and you have the harpoon gun, of course you need the barrels and the tank, and the list goes on and on. I spent 30 years of my life tracking this stuff down, and uh, I think I did a pretty good job, considering I found out that I probably have one of the largest collections in the world. And whatever happened to the ultimate Jaws prop? Quint's trusty fishing boat, the Orca, which served as a floating set for nearly four months of shooting at sea. Well, I had a good souvenir. I had the Orca for a while. I had the Orca shipped back to Universal Studios. We put it on the tour in the back lot. And every once in a while, I go up in my little electric cart and I visit the Orca by myself, look around, me, make sure no tourists around, nobody could see me. And I would just sit uh, inside the pilot house where I would sit in one of the cabins, right? Walk down those few steps to where all the life jackets were just hanging, dripping when the boat began to sink. And I would just kind of reminisce and kind of give thanks that that movie sort of launched my career. But I would go there alone and spend time on it and didn't tell anybody. Then one day I went for one of my, about six months later, I went for another journey back in time, down memory lane, the boat was gone. And I called up the head, head of the back lot and I said, what happened to the orca? He, he said, well, it was just rotting there. So we just, we, we, we took an ax and, and took a couple of chainsaws and we cut it up for timber and we, we, we shipped it out. And I went nuts. I went nuts. I, I feel very bad about all the things I said to that poor man who took my phone call. But I was just beside myself that they had destroyed this. This piece of wood, originally called the Warlock, by the way. It was a real boat called the Warlock. And we painted that over. That's a weird omen. And called it the Orca. And the fact that the boat was no longer in existence, it had died, you know. And it was just the strangest feel, feeling for me. But in a way, it was good for me because it cut the umbilical cord that was joining me to some of my worst memories about filming that, that movie. And it kind of freed me when they broke the boat into many pieces. But I did recover both twin screws. I got the propeller blades back, and I got the, uh, I got the pilot wheel. The Orca is a cast member. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Joe Alves built an exact replica uh, on pontoons, uh, which was affectionately called the Orca II. The Orca II, a fiberglass stunt double that was designed to sink and reemerge on command, has remained on the vineyard. Islander and Jaws boat wrangler, Lynn Murphy, has kept her on a shoreline in Menemsha since filming completed. When they clean up after a movie, they got to pick up their junk and clear it out. They said, well, we got to get rid of this stuff. So I bought the locker. I looked it over, and there was lumber and things in the special effects badge, and I wasn't sure just exactly how I was going to use it at the time, but I wasn't going to let it go to the dump. Yeah, you can see the 
mechanism that was under the uh, the Arker. You see all that? That was never a boat. It was never a yeah. bottom. The Orca II's resting site has served as sort of a holy grail destination for fans who have made pilgrimages to the vineyard throughout the years. Unfortunately, three decades of weather, tide, and souvenir hunters have stripped the boat down to little more than its fiberglass hull. People started to realize what all this stuff was, and over the years, it, there'd be a porthole missing, and the, we had several of the balsa wood sterns and they'd disappear, and then the flying bridge came off, and so on and so forth. Because if the sand wasn't bad enough, guys, I got pricker bushes now. I'm a real fan, huh? Trespassing is forbidden, and the marshy terrain surrounding it is quite hazardous. But none of that has deterred the more tenacious and adventurous fans from seeking to get an up-close look. Then why watch this boat sink more times than I could tell you? It's kind of nice to see it, but we got to get out of here. This is private property. Explain what we're doing here. I am one of three complete idiots out here freezing all the night looking for the Orca 2. This is it. Look at this thing. Today, virtually nothing remains of the Orca 2. This is the end of the Orca, and this is the only thing that we have left of her. We decided we'd take her home before she was all gone. They were selling her for $100 a six inch square on eBay. Finally, whatever became of Bruce himself? All of the mechanical sharks used for Jaws were returned to the back lot of Universal Studios in Hollywood, where they were stored and eventually succumbed to the elements. Throughout the span of the Jaws franchise, there have been four distinct incarnations of the mechanical shark each one aiming to improve on looks and functionality over its predecessor. But for the truest fans, it is the original, with its trademark jowls that remains the only true embodiment of Jaws. What happens is we needed a hinge. So you've got this sort of jowl kind of thing that happens, which I sort of hate it, you know, but I guess Jaws fans love it, you know. I guess the shark had a character that people uh, got familiar with. Though he's been replaced by a dissimilar shark in recent years, Universal Studios Hollywood once showcased this casting from the original Bruce Mold as a photo op for visitors to the park. Today, he remains the last copy from that mold, but has since been relegated to a junkyard in the San Fernando Valley. Universal Studios, with locations in Hollywood, Orlando, and Osaka, Japan, has kept their attractions up to date throughout the years. But the lasting popularity of Hollywood's model blockbuster has assured it an enduring place in all three theme parks to this day. Our shark, which has been here since the mid-70s, you know, works a heck of a lot better than the shark in the movie ever worked. But the reason I think it rates so highly still to this day is because Steven was so good at using the camera as the shark, so 40 minutes into the movie, when you finally see the shark, you're so terrified of it. And I think that's still in people's minds when they come here and ride this attraction. They're terrified of the shark before they ever see it. So uh, we don't have to do a whole lot to make people scream, so it's great. The backlot shark itself has even made cameos in other Universal productions throughout the years, usually being played for laughs. But whether for humor or for screams, one thing is certain. At Universal Studios, even after 30 years, the shark is definitely still working. For a brief moment in time, life seemed to imitate art, as the waters of Martha's Vineyard once again hosted the presence of a great white. Only this time, the shark wasn't constructed from rubber and steel. September 21st, I'll never forget that, that date, 2004. The big why is, is why that shark swam not only in shallow waters, but way up into a very tight, shallow estuarine system. What motivated that shark to get in there, uh, we'll never know. Shark! The shark! When the Great White surfaced in Jaws, Amity Island had to call in Richard Dreyfus as ichthyologist Matt Hooper. Matt Hooper, I'm from the uh, Oceanographic Institute. I want to 
But the vineyard has its own resident shark expert in Greg Skoma of the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. So many differences between 1975 and 2004, and that's the fact that instead of uh, all the townspeople going out and, and trying to kill it with a dynamite explosives and shotguns, spear guns, you name it, the, the public kind of embraced this animal. And the cry I got that far outweighed the negative was this positive, quit messing around and save that shark. Over the that we can learn to be concerned for this animal that Jaws taught us to dread and get past that mythology to look behind the Jaws and look at this wild animal that's in need of help and draw on our humanity to rescue it, I think, is, is a step in the right direction. And that step is no small one. Despite infrequent but highly publicized shark attacks in recent years, the general public's attitude towards sharks has indeed come a long way since the 70s. One of the problems of creating a perfect villain, a machine that kills and eats and makes little sharks, is that the public quickly subscribes to that easy view of the shark as dreadful enemies. Jaws and its sequels, unfortunately, made them easy to dislike. It made people very conscious of sharks and we then realized that we had to put the facts right to really convince people that, that sharks are to be respected and we must learn to live with them in the ocean. The great white shark, for instance, has been protected for several years now and the numbers are slowly coming back. Over the last 30 years, our, the science has evolved so we understand that sharks have a place in the ocean um, and, and it's an important place. Environmental groups like Environmental Defense, the New England Aquarium, and others with whom I work have found that the association with JAWS draws um, people to at least listen to what I have to say. So it has given me the opportunity to have a third career in the sense of being a spokesman for uh, the environment and for the oceans. Look at that animal, will you please? He is just magnificent. One of the great freedoms that JAWS gave me was to learn about the ocean that I had written about so that for the past 30 years, Wendy and the kids and I have been able to go around the world diving with all of these animals of different kinds, learning the problems that they face, the truth about them having to do with sharks, for instance. If we could harness all the interest in JAWS, from the fans of JAWS to the enthusiasts for JAWS to the people who see it and who learn from it and who are liking it, into a protection movement for the oceans, we'd have a, a massive force going. The gilt-edged bite of Jaws on so many of today's pop culture artisans speaks powerfully to the stamina of this single film. Its extraordinary shelf life has allowed it to function as sort of a creative well from which filmmakers may draw inspiration and innovation, a well that never seems to run dry. Anyone who's around my age, you know, who's in this movie business, always kind of cites Jaws as like the first movie they remember seeing or the movie that made them want to get into movies or, or started their love affair with movies. I still remember the first time that I saw Jaws in the theater and how it affected me. I walked away thinking, I want to learn how to do that when I get older. And it absolutely changed the direction of my life in one night. I, I'm always really you know, grateful when anybody, especially a young director, comes over to me and tells me that they were in some way strangely influenced by, by Jaws. And I say, well, great, you're part of our club then. You know, you got it. I aggressively pursued Jaws as a way to learn from the master. You know, I saw the light. You know, I saw Jaws and I saw that's that's, the, that's the, the promised land up there. That's what you have to aim for. It affected me in filmmaking, just wanting to make movies that were larger than life. Certainly, I think it was one of those, those big films in my life that inspired me eventually to, to uh, want to go on and be a filmmaker. I think that anyone that wants to make big Hollywood blockbuster movies was certainly inspired by Jaws. Probably every film I make, I'm always evoking Jaws in one way or another. It's like one of the basic films that drives me as a filmmaker. I've worked with Steven on three projects and I still stand next to him, and every time I look at him, I go, that's the guy that did Jaws. That's the reason why I'm here. I hope the picture has inspired a lot of filmmakers. I mean, that's another added benefit 
to this whole miraculous event. The hardest thing in the film business is not so much to do something that's usually successful. Harder than that is to create something that has longevity. There have been a lot of great pictures made, but one of the tests is the test of time. The fact that that film and the music that went with it lingers in people's minds is a lot of things. I mean, it's a great compliment to me and to Steven Spielberg and the people that wrote it and acted it and all of that. It's, it's quite an amazing thing for an actor who was really an insignificant player in the scheme of things to have a lifelong tale <laughs> of a fish tail behind me. Those first instincts that David and I had when we read the manuscript by Peter Benchley proved correct. And it feels good to know that that it's lasted all this time. Almost every week or month, somebody who knows that I was connected with the production will tell me where they were. It's like the beginning of World War II, the death of Kennedy. The emotional experience provided by Jaws will go on and on and on and on forever. I mean, who doesn't like Bambi, you know? Bambi goes on forever. Snow White goes on forever. Jaws goes on forever. I certainly think that all of us went through a survival adventure together, the entire crew and cast and myself. And I have very, very good memories in many respects to the making of Jaws, but I have many more bad memories. Memories that still haunt my nightmares, still wake me up sweating. But the bottom line is I'm grateful because I went through a kind of baptism of water. And I came out of it not only alive, which was my main goal in getting through Jaws was to come out of it in one piece, but I came out of it with a career. And I will forever be grateful to no matter what I tell you about those nightmares to the fact that the dream from the nightmare was that I got a chance to make any movie I wanted to make, and that has continued to this day. Time will only tell, you know, when Jaws will fade from the collective memory. But I think as long as there are sharks in the sea, and as long as there's, there are oceans and bodies of water, and as long as there are kids with imagination, who like to torture and scare each other, Jaws is gonna be probably around for a long time. Show me the way to go home I'm tired, I wanna go to bed I had a little drink about an hour ago And it's gone right to my head Wherever I may roam By land, sea, or phone You can always hear me singing this song Show me the way to go Show me the way to go home I'm tired, I want to go to bed I had a little drink about an hour ago And it's gone right to my head Wherever I may roam By land So show me the way to go home I'm tired and I want to go to bed I had a little drink about an hour ago And it's gone right to my head Wherever I may roam By land, sea or phone you can always 
please hear me singing this song Show me the way to go The shark is working. Repeat, the shark is still working. Repeat, the shark is still working.